You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am your host, Summer Gilbert, and I am the Director of Marketing and Branding here at Pacific Companies. Today on the podcast, we are honored to be speaking with board-certified hematology oncology physician, Dr. Yazan Abu Ismal, aka Dr. Yaz. So not only is Dr. Yaz an incredible physician, he is an amazing human being. So this guy has a large social media presence, but he uses it for the good. He has a YouTube channel, um, and it's a medical informational series called Health Hacks, which I highly recommend. Uh, The videos are super informational, um, educational, they're funny, they grab your attention. Um, He has used this for multiple fundraisers to bring awareness to things that he believes in and he's passionate about. One of the largest being the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Man of the Year campaign. So all this being said, let's just jump right into it. I can't wait for you guys to hear our episode with Dr. Yaz. Well, thank you, Dr. Yaz, for being with us today. Let's start off with what made you want to go into medicine? That's a good question. Um, Well, when I first was making that decision sometime back in high school, um, I asked myself, what is the most um, meaningful impact I can make um, into another person's life or into a community using the set of skills or qualities that I have? And to me, um, you know, the clear answer was always that the most meaningful thing I can provide to another person or to a community as a whole is their health. And... um, in addition to that, I also grew up in a family of physicians. My parents are both physicians, so I was exposed to this very early on and was able to see the uh, impact this had very early on in my childhood. And um, that's how I first uh, decided to go into medicine. So while uh, looking you up, because you have a huge uh, online presence, I noticed that you are a musician and quite a good one. Tell me a little bit more um, about that. Yes, um, I've been, uh, I, I play the keyboard, and uh, I've been, ever since childhood I've been doing that, and I also compose and produce my own music. It's uh, it's, a, it's more of a side hobby that I do in my free time. It's uh, something I enjoy, and um, I think, you know, as a physician, having um, interest in other um, skills or hobbies sort of develops your personality more and the way you interact with people and patients. And it's something that's uh, been very, um, I, I try to make time for it, but it's, it's, it's hard in a career in medicine, but um, there's always something that you can maintain going forward. So we share the interest in music in common. I do sing and write songs. Um, and I, whenever I mean, music is super healing. And so whenever I would come home and have a hard day, you know, I would, I love playing music and I feel like that's when the best music comes out. It really is, yeah. So I bet being a doctor, when you've had so much stress and a hard day, music can be very helpful. Absolutely. So circling back to medicine, you come from a family of physicians. What kind of doctors are they? My father is a radiologist, and my mother is a OBGYN, a obstetrician and gynecologist. Okay. Uh, my brother is a nephrologist, so we're all kind of doing our separate things. Wow, so I bet dinner at your house is very interesting. Yeah, it's either very interesting or very boring, depending on how you look True. at it. With your parents being physicians, did you feel any pressure to follow their path, or were you just inspired by them? No, I, I didn't really feel any pressure. It was something that um, I was certainly inspired by them and um, also being able to see this very early on. So I remember, like, as a kid, I would, uh, you know, my mom would take me to the hospital during house sometimes and things like that. So I've always had um, an understanding of what a career in medicine would entail, mm-hmm. both the good and bad, and that was certainly a key factor in making a decision. So with your dad in radiology and your mom, OBGYN, what made you want to go into internal medicine? Yeah, um, so I 
first decided what career path in medicine I wanted to take sometime around the third year of my medical school. And um, at that time, um, I developed an interest in uh, hematology and uh, in particular non-malignant hematology. And I, um, you know, just found the field as itself to be very um exciting and interesting in terms of both like the basic science and the physiology of it, um, as well as the clinical aspect when I started to learn more about them throughout my career. And um, so in order to pursue a career in hematology and oncology, it takes, uh, you have to uh, first complete a residency in internal medicine, which is also a very, you know, uh, wonderful field because it gives you the opportunity to train in a broad spectrum of uh, diseases and specialties that you've become uh, acquainted with throughout mm-hmm. training. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that was the start. So did you know right away when you went into internal medicine that at the end you wanted to get into hematology oncology? I did. Um, okay. So when I first... Uh, I mean, I kept an open mind. I knew that that's what I wanted to do, but I also kept an open mind during my internal medicine training and said, you know, I'm going to explore everything else, see if there's uh, anything else that I like. Because it's very important before someone sets foot and, and dedicates their career and their path that they make an educated decision. And that's something I always tell uh, medical students. But you, you have to see it and try it before you commit to it. So being a foreign-born physician... Uh, tell us about your journey coming to the U.S. I was born in Syria, and uh, I'm a Canadian citizen, and um, I sort of grew all over the place. Um, so at some point, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, and then I did high school in Dubai, UAE, as well as um, medical school in Cornell, branch campus in Qatar, and uh, also lived in Canada at some point, so kind of all over. So was it difficult getting to Canada and then coming to the U.S.? Walk us through that transition. All right. So um, not really. Um, I think there's a lot of challenges in moving between one um, um, end of the spectrum to the other in terms of the diversity of the cultures and going from the Middle East to uh, North America and such. Um At the same time, however, I think this has been a key aspect that has um, shaped my personality and my view uh, towards um, um, diversity and sort of open-mindedness and really trying to take the best out of each culture I was part of and immersed in. And this has really had a very deep impact into the way I am both with people and as a physician because you understand where people are coming from and you're better able to communicate with them. And and that's actually something I'm very grateful for. So as a hematology oncology fellow, what do you like least and most about the specialty? Well, that's that's a very broad question uh, because hematology and oncology um, as a field has you know, historically been combined, but in reality um, incorporates very different specialties. So it includes non-malignant hematology, which is also known as benign hematology. It includes hematologic malignancies, um, as well as uh, solid tumors. And all of these uh, things are very different uh, fields on their own. And um, so what I'm going to be pursuing for the remainder of my career is um, a non-malignant hematology or benign hematology. And um, I think um, the word benign hematology is a misnomer because there's nothing really benign about the field. Uh, there are a lot of illnesses um, such as TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, um, and hemophilia and so forth that can be associated with a lot of morbidity and complications and and you really have the opportunity to create such a meaningful impact in these patients' lives and um, help them. Um, and the field of non-malignant hematology itself involves a lot of critical thinking and being able to sort of solve a puzzle um, 
that makes it very interesting. It's a very elegant uh, balance of of the way biology works in that aspect, and that's one of the uh, I think really good things about it. Are you going to go into an academic medical center? Correct. Gotcha. That's what I thought. So what has been your most interesting case so far? And for this question, remember, the majority of our listeners are physicians. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question to answer. So, you know, after, um, you know, three years of internal medicine and almost three years in hematology and oncology, there's really such uh, uh, abundance of mm-hmm. uh, cases that are either complicated or, or very interesting or memorable. Um, I think I could uh, pick a case that's relevant to the field I'm uh, uh, in. So, um, um, you know, for example, we see many cases of TTP, which stands for uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia and purpura. So most physicians already know what TTP is. I don't need to explain exactly um, what it is. Uh, but what we see in a lot of these patients um after we have introduced, you know, the standard treatment with uh, plasma exchange and steroids over the past uh, decades, which has reduced its mortality from more than 90% to less than 10%, which is uh, remarkable. But what we see with these patients is a high relapse rate. And um, a lot of these patients will relapse and develop disease recurrence. And, um, you know, one of the interesting uh, cases I see is that, um, or I've seen as uh, patients who've relapsed multiple, multiple times. So we've had patients who relapsed up to four times. Wow. And the interesting thing is that um, in at least a couple of patients uh, who have developed um, uh, relapse, uh, many patients will have a biochemical relapse and um, as defined by a positive inhibitor and a low NMTS-13 level without clinical uh, disease, meaning without clinical traumatic microangiopathy with normal blood counts and no active disease. And, um, you know, more recently, we've, uh, based on some emerging data, we've been treating these patients just based on their biochemical relapse. But going with that introduction, introduction in mind, we've had, you know, about a couple of patients who had biochemical relapse that turned out not to be asymptomatic, and eventually uh, they both developed a stroke. Oh. And uh, this is a, um, you know, a new phenomenon we're starting to understand more about, that even a biochemical abnormality in this disease can be associated with significant morbidity, and that's, uh, that's going to be a major issue uh, we're learning to address and treat going forward. Wow. Thanks for sharing. So for our listeners who are getting ready to pick a specialty, is there any advice that you could give to help them kind of start the process and navigate this specialty journey? I would say that um, for medical students, um, you know, the time during which they are doing their clinical clerkships is a very good time to sort of um, experience the field. Keeping in mind that as, as a medical student, you're not seeing the full picture. So I always encourage them to not only see um, um, what, what you like and enjoy. In addition to that, see how um, the physicians in the field uh, feel about it and how, um, how well they're doing or how happy they are, what's their work-life balance and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so keep an open mind. So really kind of try to be immersed in all of these different fields uh, before you really make an honest decision on what you think you're uh, going to enjoy what you think you're capable of and what you think matches your set of qualities and uh, skills. So what's your work-life balance like at the moment? I know I see your social media and it looks like you have time to work out and be with friends, but sometimes social media can be a little misleading. But if it's not, it seems like you, you've you got this balance down. Um, in my field of hematology and oncology, I think it's a fair work-life balance. So, I mean, each field in medicine has its own um, challenges when it comes to that, um, especially when there are fields that require uh, night calls or being present at the hospital at night and so forth. And then that was the case during internal medicine. It was a tough uh, work-life balance. Um, mm-hmm. However, I think during uh, hematology and oncology, uh, training, it's um, 
reasonable. I can still make time for other things that I enjoy. Um, I can still, um, you know, have weekends off uh, every now and then, and I can still go to the gym and things like that. So it's, it's, uh, it's a good work-life balance, I would say. Would that be because with where you're at in the hospital, you're more outpatient-focused? Um, well, it's, it's not about outpatient and inpatient focus because, you know, hematology and oncology is heavy on both inpatient and outpatient uh, focus. However, it's the, um, the amount of cases as well as the critical nature of these cases. So, for instance, um, you know, my colleagues in cardiology, um, whenever someone comes in with chest pain or someone comes in with some EKG abnormality or lab abnormality, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, the time this can be a medical emergency and it requires the physician to be on site and uh, be prepared to, for example, take that patient to the cath lab and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the uh, types of medical emergencies when it comes to hematology and oncology are fewer and um, less common. So that makes it um, uh, less intense, for example, than a career in cardiology or, or critical care, for example. Not, not that they're not existent. We certainly do see our share of emergencies, uh, but I would say they are much less uh, frequent. Cool. Well, thank you for that insight because I think it's going to be really helpful for someone lo- looking into going into Hemonc and trying to see what their work-life balance would be like. I mean, that being said, um, you know, like I said, hematology and oncology is also diverse on its own. So, you know, someone can choose to be a general hematologist oncologist or become a subspecialized uh, breast oncologist or uh, subspecialized in non-malignant hematology as myself and so forth. And that the and the career options are also variable. So someone can be practicing in private practice or uh, academic institution or mm-hmm. working for a drug company or in clinical trial design and so forth. So there really are very broad opportunities to go forward. Yeah. Well, you seem pretty young. What are you, 28, 29? 29. So when did you start medical school? I started medical school when I was 19. Wow, that's young. So right out of high school. Well, uh, so the Cornell Qatar uh, branch campus where I did my medical school training is is um, unique in a sense that it provides a two-year pre-medical program, which is a super condensed sort of undergrad. So I was 17 when I went to college, and in two, and uh, I, I actually had to do my MCAT as a freshman in college, um, as do most of my colleagues on my uh, yeah, home campus. And um, so the the under uh, the pre medical program is like a super condensed two years of everything you need to know before going to med school. Uh-huh. It's very intense, and as such, uh, most of us. Uh, in my home campus, begin medical school, you know, at age 19 or 20, and uh, graduate by the time we're 23 or 24. I was 23 when I got my MD, and um, a lot of this is also based on how medical schools in the Middle East are. So, most medical programs in the Middle East um, are a total of just six years without pre-med, and uh, so the Cornell campus was sort of... um, um, I guess, inspired by this. So two years of pre-medical school as well as four years of the standard medical school based on the um, American curriculum. So is this program pretty selective with the candidates that they chose? It is. It's a, uh, so it's a branch campus of Wild Cornell in New York that they opened in Qatar about 15 or 20 years ago. And um, it's a very small campus that graduates 40 uh, positions per year. So you've been at this for a long time. Have you noticed any significant changes in medicine since you started? Wow, it changes a lot. I mean, um, every field on its own um, is evolving uh, very rapidly, especially with the advancements in technology and and research and so forth. Uh, For instance, I can comment about my field in hematology and oncology. In hematology, just, you know, very recently we're starting to see all these new treatments for hemophilia emerging that did not exist before, um, such as uh, the mimetic agent, emicizumab, and then we have all these newer agents that are coming up, advancements in gene therapy and so forth. So 
Similarly, in oncology, uh, needless to be said, we have a lot of advancements. Um, you know, like over the past decade, the use of immunotherapy um, and all the advancements in bone marrow transplant and um, cellular therapy and hematologic malignancies. So medicine, um, clinical medicine is evolving at a fast pace, um, as well as, you know, the other aspects of medicine. So now we're starting to understand more about um, you know, how people receive their information and the impact of social media on uh, global health issues and uh, medical awareness when it comes to a lot of issues, both when it comes to misinformation that spreads online as well as the role of people like us to spread correct information and facts. Since you've lived in different parts of the Middle East, do you notice, is there a big difference in the way medicine is practiced there versus here in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, there are both a lot of differences and there are, there are a lot of similarities. The similarities is that, you know, most um, reputable medical institutions internationally will try to abide by international guidelines, such as American guidelines or British guidelines when it comes to actual patient care. But the differences come in uh, both um, work culture, the medical culture, as well as the availability of resources. So a lot of the newer things that we um, do here when it comes to advanced treatment modalities, um, even even the availability of, you know, uh, certain blood tests or, or diagnostic tests that may not be available there, um, we take for granted. So a lot of the things we do here might seem like a luxury over there. And mm-hmm. uh, so that really has an impact on the way we practice medicine because when you have less resources at your hands, you're sort of tied to practicing a certain way. Yeah, it's really interesting how, you know, there are similar things and then things that are, you know, very different than here in the U.S., What's your take on integrated and holistic medicine? We've had a lot of physicians on the podcast lately that are switching towards more uh, holistic, uh, homeopathic approaches. What are your thoughts on that? That's a very good question and, you know, something we encounter often and we get this question often. You know, at the end of the day, I say that anything we recommend to patients has to be based on evidence. So if something has been proven to be effective, then I can recommend it and say that this is effective and has been proven to be safe as well and so forth. The, a lot of the complementary medicine um, modalities um, are not scientifically proven. Some are. Some have been shown to, you know, be safe and effective. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is obviously a broad uh, generalization. And others have not. And yeah. I think... Um, the most important thing is that when someone comes with an illness, that we recommend and provide the appropriate treatment that will, that has been shown to take care of that illness. So, yeah. you know, um, when it comes to oncology during my training, we see a lot of patients who have been diagnosed with cancer. And um, there's, there's a lot of misinformation that we see on the Internet um, about, certain, you know, alkaline water or, or a sugar-free diet that people are told will cure cancer, which it will not. And uh, people end up, be, you know, believing these things and refusing proper oncologic care, which usually constitutes a combination of surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy, or all the above. And then they return later after the cancer is no longer curable and has metastasized and at some point uh, fatal. So... Um, I think, you know, the important thing is that as physicians, we provide and recommend things that are effective and safe, as have been proven scientifically. If patients wish to pursue additional things in addition to that, then by all means, you know, um, if it's something that is safe then and not harmful, then that's okay. That's not always the case, however. So when we are giving patients, patients chemotherapy, we don't really know what exactly is in some of these herbal supplements and whether they could interact with the chemo, make it less effective, or make it more toxic, and so forth. So a lot of times, we are not sure if it's entirely safe or not. So it's really kind of individualized on each case and uh, a judgment call. And um, what I like to say is, you know, is, is encourage people to do their own research. 
not believe everything that is spread on social media, not believe everything that is on, you know, a Facebook timeline or a meme or, or so forth. And that was one of the reasons I started making a medical series on YouTube uh, as a way to sort of speak the language of the generation, speak the language of social media where people get their information from now and try to correct all this information and spread actual facts. With all the mixed amount of data that's on the internet and social media, do you find that a lot of patients are coming into you with an article printed out being like, okay, doctor, this is what I have now, treat me? It's like they, they saw Dr. Google before they came to see you. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we certainly encourage patients to do their research and read about their illness, read about the uh, treatments that we're recommending and so forth. There's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. We encourage that. Uh, as long as, you know, the resources that are available to them and the resources they're, go- they're going to are factual and accurate and reliable. Usually, we provide our own handouts, for example, to explain about an illness or explain about a particular treatment for the patients to read and um, and ask questions about. So is this kind of what inspired you to do your YouTube channel, Health Hacks? Yes, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I, I always, I, I really believe that nowadays people get their information in a different manner than we did in the past. Uh, most people are not going to rely on books or lectures or going to a library to get their information. No, people don't do that anymore. People no. get their information from their timeline. And that's mm-hmm. okay because things can be uh, accurate in a timeline. There can be, um, you know, reliable sources. At the same time, there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of things that spread that are so factually inaccurate that can be harmful to the community and health overall. Yeah. And my vision is that as physicians, we need to evolve and um, no longer expect that, you know, just by d- doing a lecture or publishing a paper that this is going to um, be impactful in spreading awareness. But rather, we need to catch on to the generation and speak the modern language, which today is social media. Mm-hmm. And being able to sort of utilize that in the proper fashion by spreading evidence-based facts and uh, uh, that would be a very effective tool in raising awareness on a variety of issues that I've asked about on a daily basis. Yeah, and as a marketing director, I noticed your YouTube videos are actually done really well because they're funny and entertaining and not too long, so they really draw your attention. That's kind of the intention. Um, you know, lectures can be very boring. I'm a yeah. physician, and when I'm in a lecture, oftentimes it's, it's very easy to get bored and not pay attention. Mm-hmm. So our, our idea was to make it, sort, you know, fun and useful and colorful and so forth in a way that um, keeps the audience engaged. Mm-hmm. And it's also very short and concise, where it's just the bullet points of the facts that they need to know. So most of the most of our episodes are within five minutes. So that way yeah. you can get the information that they need in a short time without losing interest and at the same time sort of keeping them engaged. So you got over 200,000 followers on your Instagram, and that's not an easy thing to organically have. Are most of your followers physicians, you know, general public, or a mix of both? It's mostly general public. A mm-hmm. lot of my colleagues do follow me, and I follow them, and we interact. And I don't know whether any of my patients are on there. There might be. Um, but I do know that many uh, patients of illnesses that I treat, for example, are, are, are on there and interested to sort of follow certain content and so forth. Uh, but the majority is general public. Well, I think it's pretty rad that you've built this big platform because now it gives you an opportunity to share evidence-based medicine and give your patients and your followers and those colleagues all real good information. Exactly, and that was the reason I started the the YouTube series, because when I first noticed that my uh, Instagram account started um, getting attention and going big, I asked myself, like, what, I mean, I should do something that is useful and be able to contribute somehow, Mm -hmm. and so I came up uh, with my my close friends with the idea that, you know, we could do a YouTube series where we pick topics that uh, people are asking me on a daily basis and um, answer these questions and um, 
The truth is it takes a lot of work because every episode we wrote, uh, we spend about a week of just fact-checking. So every word has been fact-checked. We look at the studies. So, so it's almost like writing a review article and summarizing it into five minutes of a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. So for the physicians listening, would you recommend them get involved in social media and create their own platform? I mean, since you've seen firsthand the impact and success it can bring. I think it's a matter of personal preference and what, you know, each person wants to sort of, um, uh, the way they want to share whatever they want to contribute. So, um, you know, I think it's becoming more popular with, um, you know, the current emerging generation of physicians and mm -hmm. more people are starting to feel that um, they're able to uh, share um, whether it's their knowledge or just, you know, uh, aspects of their daily life and so forth um, um, using social media. That being yeah. said, you know, um, while I do strongly believe there's a lot of good things that we can contribute as physicians uh, on uh, these platforms, there are a lot of bad things that can happen. And I think, um, um, you know, a lot of the younger doctors, uh, are, you know, this is a new topic and everyone is learning about this as we uh, move forward in time and, and technology mm -hmm. and so forth. But a lot of bad things can be done. A lot of, uh, um, it can be handled inappropriately. And that's something I also caution, um, trainees and medical students about when it comes to the use of social media. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you know, in this age of Google, there's so much information. So if you have actual doctors available on social media that you can follow in all different specialties, I think, I mean, that is so important and that's going to be a huge help to those that are, you know, lost on the internet because of all the overwhelming amount of information that's available. I mean, it's really important that someone you know, we want to do the work for them. We want to do the researching and, the, um, you know, obtaining the facts and so forth. And, you know, it is our job, obviously. So it's, um, it's, it's nice to be able to relay that in a way that's accessible to them. Um, mm -hmm. And I stress the point here that, you know, it's all about being evidence-based because a lot of times, um, you know, there's new trends that come up with social media uh, where, um, for example, personally, I, I, you know, when there's a big account, physicians are often approached by certain companies to, for example, um, you know, make a comment about their product or endorse a product or promote a product. And mm -hmm. in reality, at least in my experience, most of these uh, products are not FDA approved. They're not um, FDA regulated. And as such, we don't know what's uh, contained in them. So I always caution yeah. the younger doctors and medical students that um, it's uh, to not sort of be enticed by these kind of um, social media trends because these substances could potentially be harmful. We just do not know because they're not regulated. Yeah, that's good advice. And that was actually one of my questions. I was going to ask you, do you get approached by a bunch of different companies asking you to promote their product? Yeah, all the time on a daily basis, and I personally choose not to do um, these sort of uh, promotions. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are certain products that are harmless. So, you know, when it comes to, I don't know, electronics or clothes or something, if yeah. someone wishes to, to pursue that, I think it's a matter of personal choice, and that's okay. But as physicians, uh, most of the time we're approached by companies that are selling uh, supplements or certain products that make claims, a variety of claims, you know, weight mm -hmm. loss or um, things like that, uh, or boosting your immunity or boosting your testosterone and things like that. And these companies, um, you know, and who knows, maybe they're effective, but the thing is there's no way for us to be able to prove that because these products are not regulated by the FDA. Yeah. And as such, if you make a recommendation for a product, and uh, even even if we don't, even, you know, a lot of people will say this is not an official medication, consult your physician, as they should. But even having the image of a physician use the product indirectly tells the consumer that, hey, this doctor is taking it, so it's got to be okay. But it may not necessarily be the case. And, um, and a lot of these supplements 
may or may not contain harmful substances, and as such, we have to be careful uh, about this issue. And yeah. at the current time, I just say avoid all of it. Yeah, I can tell when I was looking at your Instagram beforehand, it didn't look like you were collaborating or promoting any other products. Very rarely. I mean, I uh, last year, there was a medical app that uh, was developing, and um, they are providing a new diagnostic modality that I truly thought would be effective. And mm-hmm. things like that, on very rare occasion, um, I will agree to, but... Beyond that, I avoid the majority. I avoid advertising in general and yeah. promotion. Not sure. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, we're already out of time. So the last question. This is one that we ask most doctors at the very end of the podcast. So for our listeners that are in residency right now, so is there anything that you know now that you wish you knew back when you were in residency? Uh, that's a that's a tough question to answer. Uh, personally, I have been fortunate to have been exposed to uh, a lot of this early on in my life. So I sort of knew what I was going into before I went into it. Mm-hmm. But uh, what I would like to say to people who are interested in going into a medical career is that, you know, you should always remember that this is a long journey. It takes a lot of commitment, a lot of sacrifice. Uh, when it comes to your time and personal life and so forth. So you have to really absolutely believe in it and believe that you could do it and enjoy it and love it and be passionate about it before embarking on that career. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, um, you would be making a wrong decision. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to squeeze one more question in because you do seem very passionate about um, your specialty at the moment. But if you had to go back and switch out your specialty you couldn't do hemonc internal medicine what specialty do you think you would choose um if i wanted to pick a different specialty um i don't know i mean there was a point in medical school where i was interested in um, psychiatry and there was another point where i was where i considered uh, sort of cosmetic uh medicine Um, Ultimately, I decided that, um, you know, um, I would be best at this and this is the most thing I enjoy and find um, impactful. Uh, Before I became a doctor, I went to medical school, I wanted to be a filmmaker. Uh, How many people know this? And and, uh, now I do it part-time in in these sort of uh, uh, episodes and so forth. I do the directing and the filming and the video effects and the editing and the full thing. Mm Well, I can tell you have a really good balance of your left and right brain, and you think a doctor is being more, you know, right-brained, analytical, that kind of thing, but between your music and all your passions and your videoing and your creativity on social media, you got a really good balance, and I think that's going to benefit you as you progress in in your career. I hope so. Well, thank you, Dr. Yaz, for being on the Doc Lounge podcast. I know your time is very valuable. What does the rest of your day look like? Um, just meetings um, on research products that, that not products, research projects that I'm uh, going to be working on and um, just kind of finishing some publications. Cool. Well, thanks again for talking with us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. No problem. Well, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, go to www.pacificcompanies.com.